Welcome back to Political Misfits on Radio Sputnik, where we bring you news, politics, and culture without the red and blue treatment. I'm John Kiriakou here with Michelle Witte. Well, the big news of the day, and perhaps the biggest news in quite a long time, is that a New York grand jury has indicted former President Donald Trump on 34, apparently 34, felony counts of business fraud. At least some of that is related to the payment of what is alleged to be hush money to former porn star Stormy Daniels, with whom Trump reportedly had an affair or a one night stand or something. Who knows? Trump is the first current or former president to be charged with crime in all of American history. One of Trump's attorneys said the former president will turn himself in to New York authorities on Tuesday when he will be photographed, fingerprinted and arraigned. That's when the specific charges will be unsealed. He will likely be released on his own recognizance. Legal scholars say, however, that this may be a tough case to prove. The state must rely on Trump's former personal attorney, Michael Cohen, as their star witness. Cohen already has been convicted and served prison time on federal charges related to his role in the scandal. Furthermore, the state's case rests on a legal theory that has never been attempted before. Prosecutors have never before combined a falsifying business records charge with a violation of state election law and a judge could throw the charges out or reduce them from a felony to a misdemeanor. And even if Trump were to be convicted, all of the charges are thought to be, at this point, Class D felonies, the least severe felonies. Trump could face a total of four years in prison, although Class D felonies do not require prison time. Republican elected officials, meanwhile, have rallied to Trump's defense, even some of his political detractors said last night that the case was a witch hunt and that the indictment would only serve to make Trump even more popular among the Republican base. Indeed, a poll taken by Fox News and released yesterday showed Trump's lead over Florida Governor Ron DeSantis doubling from 15 points to 30 points. Trump now leads DeSantis 54 to 24 with all other Republicans in single digits. Steve Grumbine is the founder and CEO of the nonprofits Real Progressives and Real Progress in Action and host of the podcast Macro and Cheese. Steve is also a leading activist and evangelist for modern monetary theory. Good to have you back, Steve. Welcome. Hey, thanks for having me back, guys, gals. <laughs> Good to talk to you. And let's jump right into this prosecution of Donald Trump. There is so much to consider. So first, we're talking about state charges here rather than federal charges. Why do you think that is? Why did the feds elect to let the state take the lead while the feds went after Michael Cohen? Couldn't these just as easily have been federal charges? You know, I haven't given this the kind of thought that a legal scholar would give it, but just as a lay person thinking it through, if you've ever escalated a problem with, you know, a, a workplace situation or something to do with your local baseball team or anything else, you don't jump straight to the president and CEO. You, you kind of give yourself an opportunity for a fallback. It's the only thing I could think of was that maybe they felt like they had more control over the outcomes at the state level, or maybe they wanted to prevent themselves from going straight to the top, having rejected being tossed away. I, I really don't know. Like, like I could speculate all day long. It does seem kind of weird, but to me, it, it's quite possible that they kind of know the people at the state level and they figure they have a better shot at doing something at the state level than they would at the federal level, given the, the makeup of the federal courts. Yeah. Um, anything's possible. I know you're not an attorney. I'm not an attorney. Michelle's not an attorney. But uh, Donald Trump released a, a statement last night on Truth Social about the judge. Here's what he said about the judge. And I'm going to read it as he wrote it. The judge, quote, assigned, unquote, to my witch hunt case, in capital letters, a, quote, case, unquote, that has, all caps, never been charged before, hates me. His name is Juan Manuel Marchan, which is misspelled. He was handpicked <laughs> by Bragg and the prosecutors. Um. A spokesman for the New York State Courts said that the attorney, the district attorney's office absolutely does not pick judges. Uh, the judges are assigned randomly. They're, they're put in a wheel. And I know that because a guest we've had on the show, Tom Fitzpatrick, was a New York City judge for 32 years. It's all random. But 
as I started by saying, none of us are attorneys. It seems to me that any attorney would tell Donald Trump, shut your flapping gums. You're only going to get yourself in more trouble. Yeah, but I also feel like people have been saying that to Donald Trump for uh, decades now. So I don't know. I mean, I don't. It's not going to be the first time the idea is presented to him that shutting up would be a better course of action. Yeah. What do you think? I I think Donald Trump is you know, uh, uh, just an outright kook, but I think he's brilliant on so many levels of, of this kind of game, right? This, this is his, this is his mud pit. Yeah. This is where he likes to live and play. Right. And he understands the rules of the mud pit better than anybody. And the mud pit says, if you say something, it's harder to claw it back than it is to just say it and see what happens. Yeah. Once he has put the bat signal out to every MAGA there is, once he's put the bat signal out to even the quote-unquote lefties now that are typically anti-Dem, they would rather own the Dems than fight the Repubs, so to speak, now you've got them becoming sympathetic to Donald Trump's case. Mm -hmm. And then you've got the rank-and-file Republicans who maybe squabble in the one side but in the end, they're better at falling in line than probably anyone else. So Donald I, Trump is. It, no, go ahead, Steve. Go ahead. I, I, I think Donald Trump is literally doing what he always does, and that is showing himself to be the little guy fighting the big guy. And he's not even worried about it because he knows in the end he's going to win. And everybody around him says, that's the strong guy I'm going to follow into the bar. I mean, and that's what he's done. And I do think in terms of this case, this case is the best one for him to make a bunch of noise about. Because this is the one that is the most, the biggest reach, really, when it comes to, you know, uh, being able to actually nail him on this and also being able to justify charging him with this kind of crime when, you know, it, it's sort of a thing that is known to happen. You know what I mean? Like, the other things that he is accused of would seem to be a lot more serious and probably have a lot more, you know, uh, be less likely to be able to be cast uh, 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 justifiably as witch hunts, you know? So this is the one he probably should be making a bunch of noise about. Yeah. I don't know. That's Agreed. what I feel. Yeah. Yeah. No, you're right on the money. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I you're not going to talk a bunch about Georgia because that's a lot harder to defend. A you know what I mean? But this defend. going like, well, all right, come on, yeah. guys. Like you did, it took you years. Well, let, you went after Michael Cohen, and then it took you years to decide to go after me. You had to have all these discussions about it, apparently. Right. And now, you know, you telling me nobody else has ever paid hush money during a campaign to, you know, it's just really, it does seem, uh, it it does seem extremely political. And, well, let's talk about that for a second because I I agree with you. This. This case to me seems far more political than the Georgia case. Mm. Steve, the Washington Post, the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal today all say that this is going to be a tough case case to prove. They say that the legal theory is untested and that the case is not a given. It seems to me that this is a real risk. Why are you taking an untested legal theory yeah. to, uh, uh, in exactly. an unprecedented way, charge a, pre- a, former, a president. former president? Especially when you have other <laughs> options. And, and if if the prosecutors lose this case or the, or the charges are thrown out or the charges are reduced to misdemeanors, they make Donald Trump look like a hero, yeah. a champion. Um, he's already the front runner for 2024. What do you think? Is this a gift for, for Trump politically? If he wins this thing, it seems to me like he's going to be tough to beat. This is a guy that has been impeached twice. He is a guy that has witnessed the world lose its mind about every tweet he's ever put out there. He is a guy that is a master manipulator. This is manna from heaven for this guy. Yeah. He, he's like sitting there thanking everyone for doing this. Like if there was ever a way to literally steal every ounce of oxygen from DeSantis's campaign and Donald Trump's clearly is always subscribed to the idea that there is literally no such thing as bad press. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And he is sucking it up. I, I, I'm telling you, this is, 
this should show you either a the democrats and their ilk are the most feckless group of people known to mankind or b this is real theater and Mm -hmm. we're watching it play out and it's so unbelievable that it has to be the way it is it's just who would write the script? Seriously. Who would write the script? I, I don't recognize American <laughs> politics anymore. I was also interested to see last night that Republicans in the House have just been jumping up and down over this indictment, while Republicans in the Senate have been virtually silent. Uh, explain the politics behind this, Steve. Why are we seeing this dichotomy between these two groups of Republicans? Well, let's think about that. Senators tend to represent the entire state or part of the state anyway. They're they're state reps. The Congress critters, they have little teeny districts and they represent little people and they, they go out in their communities and they meet these people and they shake hands with these people. They probably have an office building right there in the town square where people can come and see them even. So there's a very different mindset in the house as to what they do and who they are and where they sit and who they mingle with and interact with Mm -hmm. and who this very exclusive club of senators that represents the interests of both interestingly kind of both parties they they're kind of the bipartisan candidate of sorts when you're in that senate role um there's there's very few ideologues at the senate level i mean they tend to be a much their, their goal is to be the backstop to block pr- populism from making it into law. And uh, the I think the House is kind of where populism you know, has its energies. So it makes perfect sense that the MAGAs at the congressional level would be chirping because most of them got in on the coattails of Donald Trump. Donald Trump, sure. Yep. There were coattails. And I'm dying to get your yes, comment on, on Mike Pence's statement. You know, he made it last night and he reiterated it on CNN this morning that he is outraged, 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 I tell you. He's outraged by the Trump indictment. It's like this guy just can't seem to allow himself to break out of the mold of being Donald Trump's lapdog. What gives with Mike Pence? This was, a, this was an opportunity to set himself apart from Donald Trump and he just can't do it. Yeah. I, you know, I think this is the danger of the societal view of Donald Trump, right? When you're on the outside of Congress looking in, these people see Donald Trump as the guy who gave the finger to the Democratic Party and yeah. to the establishment as a whole. And so for many people, some unschooled, unlearned, uh, that just find that kind of crass, kind of in-your-face thing great, He's their, you know, he's their whisper. Mm-hmm. Um, with Pence, Pence lacks a personality. He's kind of a quiet dude that just sort of is silently a Christo fascist, you know? <laughs> and he's a little different than Donald Trump. And so, and you know, he was always brought in, I think, on the Trump ticket to provide that kind of level-headed yes. thing that the establishment wanted to see. The problem is, is that that's a very lonely place to be without Donald Trump if you're in that side of the house. Yes. The, the old school, the old, the old cloth coat Republican, the, the kind of, oh, yeah, I'm a Tea Party guy, but I'm not really going to scream and yell kind of gang. They, they don't have the same panache <laughs> that the, yeah. the MAGAs have. And so you figure if he were to do that, he would literally be completely neutered. Yeah. Because that party has gone full, full on crazy. Um, so he has to maintain kind of a, a leg in crazy camp to go along with trying to maintain his his other side. Mm-hmm. I, it, it's a bet that he's not willing to make is what you're seeing. Yeah, it's a gamble. He's not willing to put all his chips on the table. Yeah, because once you cross Trump, you're on the outside. That's, that's it. it. You're done. And there's no going back in. That's right. Yeah, I think that's right. Alvin Bragg, the Manhattan District Attorney, has taken a lot of heat over the past six months or or so, six to 12 months, for not focusing on street crime in New York, on violent crime, on gun crime. 
We're seeing a, a big spike in crimes committed in the subway system, people being pushed in front of trains and people being just beaten down on the subway platform. The truth is that overall crime in New York is down. Uh, gun crimes are up, but overall crime is down. And in the meantime, Bragg has been focusing on this Trump case. What does all of this mean, do you think, for Alvin Bragg? Is it a net positive or a net negative for him? Or will we not know that until the case has run its course? I think that your final statement is the right one. But I think that what you have to understand is he didn't get into office on his own. No, he, he did not just decide, I want to be in this office, therefore I shall. He had a network of people that, you know, all the political games that are played to get in these kind of high visibility positions. I am sure, I, well, I shouldn't say I'm assured. I, in my mind, I'm sure that what is going on here is, is that this was kind of his purpose. And this is the role that he is playing and that there will be a reward at the end of the rainbow if he if he does what he has to do. I, I can't prove any of that. That's complete. And let me just say a pure hot take. Mm-hmm. I have no nothing to back that up other than it makes sense to me. Yeah, um, that that that's sort of what I, the, the payola, if you will. We have this Hey, mission impossible. We have a job for you. Take out a president by you know, going after Stormy Daniels and the hush money. Okay, done deal. Now, when you're done, we'll go ahead and bring you back into J.P. Morgan, and then we'll put you back in government, and then we'll put you back in your know, city, and we'll be you know, that kind of thing. That in and out of the you know industry. Here's an opportunity for him to climb a ladder that you know most of us don't even know exists. Um, that's that's my take once again as well. I know there's a lot of people genuinely, and this is hard for me to imagine because I'm a Green New Dealer. I'm a guy that's looking to end student debt. I'm a guy that's looking to provide health care to all. So to me, the only thing that matters in this world is saving the people that are struggling. Yeah. And this is a distraction in my mind. However, with that in mind, I know there are people that genuinely in their heart of hearts believe this is the most important thing you could ever do because you know Donald Trump, if he is given an opportunity, this elite uh, breeds more fascism in the United States and this and that and the other. So I believe that there are people that genuinely have a heartfelt belief that this is the right thing to do. I think they're wrong. Mm -hmm. Um, But that said, here we go. And so um, guys like uh, this, this prosecutor, if you will, he's, you know, he's, he's representing a large group of people that got swept up in the Donnie tiny hands, Orangino, Mm -hmm. you know, you know, Mr. Uh, Don, the con, all the other, Mm -hmm. you know, lib nicknames they dubbed him. I mean, the bad comb over the big beer belly, the tiny winky, whatever it is that they want to put out there. Right. All the things, right. This plays right into that. And those people, they have been so owned by the Trump specter. They, you know, years and years later, after he's no longer in office, they can't stop thinking about him, man. He he's it's if you remember Aaron Rodgers at playing in Chicago and he's yelling at the crowd, "I still own you, I still <laughs> own you." That's what I see Donald Trump. Imagine him doing the championship belt like Aaron Rodgers used to do, yelling at the crowd, "I still own you." He does. I hate the guy, but he is a master, mm. an absolute he master. He is. And he's been <laughs> underestimated time and time again. He's a survivor. He really is. There were a couple of, of non-Trump issues that I wanted to, um, to ask you about, too. First, the FBI yesterday released new details from the file of Stephen Paddock, the man who, in 2017, killed 58 people and injured more than 500 more with a high-powered rifle that he used to fire at them from a room at the Mandalay Bay Casino and Hotel in Las Vegas. The FBI seems to conclude that Paddock did this because he was upset at how he and other high rollers were treated by the casinos. But he didn't go after any of the people or the businesses whom he thought had somehow wronged him. So what the FBI files are telling us is that Paddock lost apparently between two and three million dollars playing video poker. How much time must it take to lose three million dollars <laughs> at video poker? And he, be- he believed that he should have been given penthouse suite rooms, 
free flights, free cruises, which apparently he had been given in the past because he had lost so much money. Instead, he had been banned from three casinos in Reno, and he wasn't getting the penthouse suite. He was getting a free room, but it was a little bit lower. And, uh, and he had been banned from three casinos in Reno. So the FBI documents don't make any definitive conclusions, but I'd like to get your take based on, on what we know. Um, you know, this is one of the, this was one of the worst mass killings in the history of the country. And we really don't understand the man's motivation. Mm. You know, I've talked about this several times over the last several years. You notice how right after it happened for about 10 minutes, everybody talked about it. Oh, yeah. And then, and then, it then went no, away. One, no one talked about yeah. it at mm -hmm. all. Now, I want you to think about what you just said. You said it was the most massive killing. Yeah. At, like ever. Yeah. Right? Ever. Not not for the last 15 minutes. Right. I mean, it, like it the ranks up there with word, Oklahoma right? City, for example. Uh, exactly. And, and you do hear about Oklahoma City. You do hear about. McVeigh, and especially with the recent Waco uh, documentary that came right. out, you got to see the tie-ins between Waco and Oklahoma City. Mm -hmm. But this right here, you know, you had the, the Alex Jones crew coming out saying that it was crisis actors and yes. it was fake, of course. Yes. But but the thing that made it weirder was it just vanished. Yeah. So dude. coming out with some random. Uh, he was angry at he didn't get enough chips at the casino and didn't get enough perks. I, it just doesn't hold a lot of water to me. I, like I, I, I'm, I'm on a higher level. I'm very concerned about that shooting because I don't feel like we've ever really heard anything. It, it literally fell off the map so fast mm -hmm. that it made me question it more than anything mm -hmm. that has ever happened. Any any event in American history, that one mm -hmm. probably stands out the brightest. Uh, for weird things that stop getting talked about. Yes. I would say that stands out. Close second. Remember two years ago when somebody blew up a city block in Nashville? And we all, remember the yes! truck bomb in Nashville? Oh, my God. I, yeah, dude. I he forgot all up. about that. He killed eight people. Oh, yes. no, sorry. He killed himself. He injured eight people. He, yeah, I remember. He damaged dozens of buildings. Like, he damaged. That was a one-day story. A block of a city. Yeah. And it was like, oh, right? I guess he was mad at his girlfriend. Gosh, that completely the slipped end. my mind. And I guess maybe some of these crimes truly are motiveless, but it really, it does seem like we spend a lot of time trying to figure out the motives of some uh, of some of these uh, crimes. And, you know, once you find out where those motives are, see like who planted them and fi find a chain, you know, like a, a daisy chain of who's ultimately responsible. And for some of them, it's just like, yeah, wow, guess some people are weird. <laughs> then that's it and i don't know i i don't know if it's random but uh yeah it's a, it's very strange yeah very strange indeed it, it is strange it, this sucks the life out of me though because how many people got killed 50 what 58 Three, weren't you saying was 58? it 53 58 let me look 63 yeah it was uh it was uh 58 dead and more than 500 wounded J just think about the odds of 500 wounded people not talking about this daily. Right. If I got right. shot, if I was at a oh. thing like that. So true. I yeah. could not stop talking about it. <laughs> so yeah. true. Same here. It would be, it would be like the cause for the rest of my life. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes. I, I wouldn't rest until I figured it out. I mean, yeah. it, you know what I mean? Like it just went away. Yeah. And I'd be suing <laughs> Alex Jones. Yeah. And, but equally, it does yeah. seem like I don't know how you get, you know, uh, get 500 people to stay silent about what they right. saw. You know right. what I mean? Like, none of it makes sense, right? That, I don't that think that was a country western concert that was happening yeah. below the, the site of the shooting. Yeah, you think maybe a bunch of people yes. do have a bone to pick. Yeah. You know I think? don't know. I don't want to generalize about country Jeez. western listeners, but I'm sure some of them have some uh, anti government uh, sympathies. You'd think. Yeah. Something. I don't know, man. It, it, they might talk about it to somebody, but it just vanished. So that to me is the greater story in that than this. I mean, yeah. I, again, just the shock of it, it happening and then literally scanning the news and seeing nothing, nothing. Mm -hmm. about it. Nothing. And what's More crazy is bizarre. that now the, the FBI has finally re released these, uh, these documents and, and there's no conclusion. They're like, oh, we, we don't know what happened.
Yeah. We don't know why he did it. Draw your own conclusions. Yeah, draw but your own n- conclusions. Don't draw your own right. conclusions about anything else. We'll right. not give you any evidence, but we'll tell you what to think. It is uh-huh. kind of the opposite uh, approach when you think about it. Yeah. Uh, this sure has this is. has Chinese fingerprints on it. Don't ask us why. Yeah. Uh, here's, uh, here's a bunch of evidence <laughs> about Stephen Paddock. Couldn't possibly tell you what made him do it. No. No idea. <laughs> we interviewed a couple no of gamblers whose names we redacted, and they think it was because he was unhappy with the size of his hotel room. I guess there were no national fingerprints on that one. Right. There were like <laughs> ha- bare hairs all over it. Hey, the trial of five members of the Proud Boys, Steve, is continuing or has continued really all week here in Washington. Yesterday, an FBI agent, and, and I so have enjoyed this. Yesterday, an FBI agent who had infiltrated the Proud Boys testified on behalf of the Proud Boys. Mm-hmm saying that the, the group neither led nor inspired the push into the Capitol building on January 6th, 2021. The interesting thing here is that the FBI itself is calling the, the operation an intelligence failure. Mm-hmm. And the FBI agent said, no, no, this wasn't an intelligence failure. The reason why we never saw it coming is because these guys were innocent. This is the FBI guy saying it. So wow. it was that the Proud Boys had nothing to do with the spontaneity of the riot that day. For the first time, I'm coming around to the idea that maybe these guys are innocent of the charges against them in that they were not the masterminds. They were a bunch of big talkers that the FBI overestimated. And the day got away from the FBI mm-hmm. and the Capitol Police and the D.C. Police and everybody else. I think there's also a reporting in there that says the FBI was constant. They were very focused on Antifa. I, I, I was going to say and the so same they're, thing. So they're spending a lot of time talking to the frat boys like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. I know we're all, we're all super pumped about that rally, guys. But yeah. what, what can you tell me about Antifa? Yeah. Which uh-huh. may be why they might Antifa. have missed something. Oh, my God. It, 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 let, let, me, let me say this. And this is just my grumbine version of the world here. You know, as a lefty, I recognize that, you know, every time you've seen uh, a government do something really crazy, like a fascist government, they end up disarming the people. I'm not a Second Amendment guy. I don't own a gun. But I recognize that there is reasons why that may not be the best answer to the problem we are facing. The other thing is I also recognize that the left in, you know, other situations has been the revolting, the party that has been taking the revolution to the to the establishment. And in the U.S., that isn't the way it is at all. I mean, we are a right-wing country. Both parties are right-wing, uh, et cetera. But I think to myself, as a burgeoning left-wing in this country even tries to coalesce, this stuff is really in a way targeted towards that because – None of these folks, nothing's happening. Nothing's really happening. And, and the people that are having things happen to them are the little teeny bit players. Yeah. It's, it's, it's like going after Madoff instead of Paulson or instead of the folks at J.P. Morgan or, or uh, even, uh, what's his name, um, Barack Obama's AG. What was his name? I can see uh, his Eric face right now. Yeah. It's the, I mean, we're not, we didn't go after any of the big dogs. Nah. We went after all the pikers. Tell me and, and once again, here we are again going after the pikers. So mm-hmm. I, I personally um, find the Proud Boys to be repulsive for every reason everybody else might. But, yeah, I, I, this all smells to high heaven. I'll just leave it at that. I have to agree. You know, there was a there was a piece, too, today in The Washington Post about uh, well, th- there have been pieces all week about AR-15s. Right. And, and they're doing these big photo spreads and videos. A couple of days ago, they, they did a series of five or six videos asking just random people, why do you own a, an AR-15? And they were kind of silly. One guy was a one guy was a uh, uh, teacher and he said, this this gun looks like a gun should look like. And uh, it's really cool <laughs> looking. So that's why I bought it. And another a woman says, oh, I have. 25 guns and this just sort of filled out my collection and everybody had these different silly reasons for buying an AR-15. Well, today the article is about why trans and non-binary people are buying AR-15s and it's to protect them from the Republicans. Mm. And so, yeah, we're, 
on this slippery slope. It reminds me of my first day of weapons training at the CIA. I was in a group of about a dozen guys, and on on at the opening of the very first class, the instructor said, "Is there anybody in here who um, does not own a gun?" And and I raised my hand. I was in the front row. I raised my hand and I turned around to look at the guys behind me, and I was the only one with my hand raised. And the instructor says, you don't own a gun? And I said, because I thought I was kind of being funny, I said, truth be told, I've never actually touched a real gun. Yeah, I know. And he's like, oh, my God. I ended up <laughs> scoring first in I, the class. Mm -hmm. And then I, I actually went into competitive skeet shooting and did well. I have a steady hand. Mm -hmm. um, because I have a felony conviction, I've lost my gun. Mm -hmm. But if I'm ever pardoned, I'd love to check out an AR-15. You know, if this is the culture and the society that we've given ourselves and everybody else has an AR-15, I'm going to take a look. I've touched a gun because when I was a young drunk, uh, in my, let's say, mid-20s, there was a bar on Capitol Hill where if you were there at last call and you were cute and they knew you, they would just lock the doors and they could stay and hang out and drink a little while. Oh, my. And sometimes the D.C. cops would come by. Uh -huh. And so sometimes a oh cop my. would come in with a couple of his buddies and you see drunk Michelle going like, look at that holster. You look so silly in your tool belt. Let me, ha you know, what's that? How much does that weigh? Let me put it on. Me? And he gave it Are to you me. Are you kidding me? Yes. An absolutely smashed young Michelle Witte. He hands over the his belt with his gun in it, oh and God. the weight of it was terrifying. And I took it, put it on, realized I didn't know anything about this weapon or how to use it or what it might do if I touched it, and sort of like giggled and gave it back to him. And then thought, well, I don't, I don't think cops are supposed to be doing this. I think wow. it's time for me to go home. Wow. Yeah, DC cops, everybody. DC cops. Steve Grumbine, thank you so much for joining us. Steve is the founder and CEO of the nonprofits Real Progressives and Real Progress in Action, and he's the host of the excellent podcast Macro and Cheese. He's also a leading activist and evangelist for modern monetary theory. You're listening to Political Misfits on Radio Sputnik. We'll take a short break because our next guest is waiting, mm -hmm. so stay tuned.